but I'm not sure I can cope with that. <laughs> Thank you, but uh, uh, anyway, you'll just see my arrogance in a minute because I. Well, first of all, I should explain the ideas. You, this shows also my stinkiness because I'm using the same slide <laughs> as I used last week, and all I did was change the date in the country. <laughs> but the talk is slightly different because I think I've thought about it a little more. Um, I don't think I can live up to all the things you said, but I'll, I'll try and do something anyway. Yeah, so the arrogance, you didn't mention that, arrogance <laughs> is that I'm going to talk about the whole universe, you see, and here's a picture of it. Uh, I should explain, oh, I need, that's what I need my jacket for. I should explain that well, this is a space-time picture, of course. Time going up the picture. Um, this, this universe is expanding. This is, uh, and you may worry about all the frilly stuff at the back there. That's just because what I have to say doesn't really... It doesn't really matter whether the universe is open or closed. Although there are details which probably make it work better if the universe is not hyperbolic. So maybe roundabout flat or, or perhaps closed up would be okay. Anyway, people seem to think it's more or less flat, so that's good for that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing you might worry about, <clears throat> if you're a cosmologist, is that the picture doesn't express inflation. Now, you see, there are two reasons why it doesn't have inflation in it. One of them is, it probably, I mean, it could do, because inflation would be tucked into that little black spot at the bottom, and you wouldn't know if it was there or not. You need a very powerful magnifying glass to see. But uh, the other reason it's not there is that I don't really believe in it. And I had a lot of trouble when I first heard about inflation, and I thought, that idea, it won't last two weeks, how wrong I was. But I should explain, there are good things about inflation, I hadn't heard about the good ones originally, the good things about inflation, and there are bad things about inflation. And one of the things inflation does not do is stretch the universe out and make it nice and smooth, and that I never believed. And to explain why I didn't believe that, let me give you an argument which seems to be pretty clear. Imagine that the universe was actually contracting and that it satisfied some sort of second law of thermodynamics in that direction. So it's a bit like what you would expect if there were irregularities, they would form black holes and so on, and they'd form an incredible mess at the end. So what you would get is not that nice smooth picture I just showed you, but some great mess like that. And that is a far more probable situation. In fact, you can work out how more probable it is. That is to say, the chance of this happening rather than a great mess like that. And I should say, you can put the infraton field in all the ingredients of inflation you like into it. It makes absolutely no difference to the fact that you have black holes and geodium and making a great mess like that. And the probability you can work out by using the Bekenstein Hawking formula to make a crude estimate, and I get a figure something like this for the universe of the sort of scale at least we see. Uh, the chances of something like that occurring as opposed to something like this, and I could be more explicit about that, is uh, something like 1 in 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 124. So this is extraordinarily special and extremely unlikely if you think of it in some sense as of having about, coming about, come about by chance. Now, I want to say a bit more about that. And in order to say a bit more about that, I would like to apply two mathematical tricks to this. And these are, first of all, well, it's better to use a smaller version of the inverse for this. So let's use a smaller version. Same inverse, I should say, not actually smaller, just a picture smaller. So I'm using two tricks. These are conformal tricks. One of them is to squash down infinity, and the other is to stretch out the Big Bang. And uh, the thing is that you get a nice smooth boundary in each case. Now the logical status of these two things is very, very different. There are good theorems, primarily due to Helmut Friedrich, which tell you that the trick for the future happens under extremely general circumstances. So as long as you have the universe dominated by massless fields and so on, and does expand in a general way, then it's very likely that the future trick will work. So this, this is, uh, works under very general circumstances. However, the opposite trick of stretching out the Big Bang only works under very, very unusual circumstances. Well, unusual, I should say, if it, it's not, it's very unrandom. 
And I want to explain a bit more about why I think it's a good idea to apply this trick. And this comes about from things which I've been talking about for decades. And I think people pay attention, but they don't tend to say much about it. It has to do with the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics tells you in rough terms that things get more random as time goes on, or if you like, the measure of randomness, you could say, is the entropy, and the entropy increases with time. That's fine. But if you go backwards in time, saying almost exactly the same thing, in backwards in time, things get less and less random, where the entropy goes down and down and down and down, until you reach the Big Bang, presumably. And what we know about the Big Bang, well, one of the most impressive pieces of observational evidence in favor of the Big Bang is the microwave background, this radiation coming in all directions, and this here is the spectrum, this is the COBE, one of the first things that one learns in detail about the microwave background. It has this spectrum, this is the frequency going in this direction and the intensity in that direction, and you find something extraordinarily close to a Planck curve. In fact, the uh, uh, error bars here are, magn are exaggerated by a factor of 500. So the, the observations fit the curve to within the thickness of the incline. So that is a very impressive piece of evidence that what you're looking at near to the Big Bang, well it's not all that near, it's about what is it, uh, 380,000 years or something, but getting, getting back towards the Big Bang, you're looking at something which is telling you that the entropy is a maximum. I always thought that's sort of like, not even the mammoth in the room, it's the diplodocus in the room, I think. You're looking at something which the observation seems to be telling you, and this is expected, I should say, people were not surprised by this, it's telling you that as far as the observations are showing this, the entropy was at the maximum. So people might say, well, the universe was pretty small in those days, and maybe that's the explanation. I should say, no, it's not. And that was well understood by Ptolemy and others, that the fact that the universe was smaller is, is no explanation. I won't go into that, but, but it's certainly not the answer. The answer is that what you're looking at is matter and radiation, and that does very closely fit a Planck curve. So that was thermalized. You're looking at a thermal state as far as that's concerned. The other thing, which was the dominant feature of the microwave background, is very uniform over the whole sky. And this uniformity is telling you, well, that's consistent. If it was just gas and matter in equilibrium, then it would be uniform. But what it's, when it's surprising is when you're thinking about gravity. So the thing is that this is not looking at gravity, you're looking at everything but gravity. And the thing is that gravity was where the universe was low in entropy. And I think this is pretty well accepted now, but not much said. Certainly not much said by people who put forward cosmological models, all sorts of models, and they hardly ever mention this issue. The issue, to me, is one of the big puzzles of the universe. The fact that not only was the universe such an extraordinarily st special state at the beginning, the Big Bang, but it was extraordinarily special in one way, and in one way only, that is with respect to gravity, and nothing else. So what is it that's special about gravity, and seems everything else is allowed to be thermalized? Well, I'll come to that issue, um, because in my view, the scheme which I want to describe to you first, uh, I'm not assuming Everybody here knows all about informal psychic cosmology, so I want to say a bit about the reasons behind it and what the idea is. Um, first of all, I want to say, what, how would you characterize the initial state as being somehow free of gravitational degrees of freedom? And this is where this picture comes in. The specialness that you need in order for it to be um, stretchable out to something smooth, this is Paul Todd's way of expressing what I referred to as the vial curvature hypothesis. I'll come to that a little bit more in a minute. But before doing that, I should say that this picture is not really wildly unconventional. In fact, it's perfect. I think people in the conventional cosmology community would say, okay, that's not a bad picture. You can, stretch, you can squash down infinity into something smooth and stretch out the Big Bang into something smooth. What I think people balk at is what I do next, which is to say that 
The universe that we talk about, when we talk about the universe usually, is what I would call one eon. This is our universe here, if you like, we, but I'm saying that's just one eon of an, an indefinitely, well, let's say an infinite sequence of eons where you're allowed to do this conformal stretching of the Big Bang and the squashing of the remote future. And the outlandish thing is to say that this squash down infinity becomes the Big Bang of another eon, and our Big Bang was the continuation of the remote future of a previous eon. So these things continue indefinitely. I suppose I was influenced by when I first learned about cosmology, I learned it about Fred Hoyle and Herman Bundy and Tommy Gold and Dennis Sharma, and these were people who were very much plugging the steady state model. And although steady state model did not really explain what well, micro background is one of the big problems with it, um, and Dennis Sharma, I had tremendous respect for him because he. Uh, when he was convinced that this microwave background was showing him something that the steady state model could not have come dead, and he said, no, no, there was a big bang, and he admitted to have been wrong, being wrong on that. But I think I sort of had an ink, a sort of feeling from all this that maybe there was something appealing about the steady state model which maybe one could recover, even though this model is in detail extremely different from the steady state model. It does have this sort of character there, that there is something which is preserved for all time. And I think it's interesting that Newton and, and Einstein, you see, fought for a static model for a long time in the face of some evidence that it was expanding and, and even introduced this cosmological constant, which I should say was part of the picture which I showed you here now, but not an Einstein's version was trying to get a static model, but his cosmological constant does seem to explain this hysterics exponential expansion, and as far as we know, now fits it extremely well. So that uh, seems to be what we're seeing, something like that, or something which looks like that. Um, okay, so this is the picture. Now, I want to make it a little bit more physically plausible. You see, this is nice geometry, and the uh, question is, is, does it make good physics? Well, um, let me say, first of all, the physics which is relevant here is the physics of, well, it's the physics of light cones. So if you think of the light, the light cones of space-time being the important thing, and here we have a couple of pictures of light cones, uh, then the one thing I should say, of course here is the light cones, and I've also drawn in how clocks behave, so you have a lot of clocks zipping along, and both are identical, and these are the first tick of the clock, second and third, so on. And the thing is about the, this picture, it describes all ten components of the metric, nine of them in the sense, well, in the sense of the ratios of those ten, give you the light cone, and the tenth one is to give you the scale. But these nine are, well, let's go to this picture next. You see, as Yvette was talking about, we, among other things, among many other things, the, we have very precise clocks these days. And I suppose the kind of basic reason that we have very good clocks, if you just go down, down to fundamental laws of physics, are the two most uh, famous uh, equations of 20th century physics. Of course, Einstein's E equals mc squared, which tells us that energy and mass are equivalent. And Max Planck's E equals h nu, nu being frequency, which tells you that E, energy and frequency are equivalent. You put the two together, and that tells you that mass and frequency are equivalent. So if you have a, a particle or something which has a very stable, um, which is which has a very well-defined mass, then it is a very, very good clock. So, so it really comes down to these very, very basic principles. The fact that this particles themselves are clocked. Of course, you can't use a particle itself as a, as a good clock, but it comes down to it, the fact that you have these frequencies which are inbuilt into nature in this very, very profound way. Now, that's telling us that, uh, okay, or, or that, that these ten components are, are very well built into the structure of space-time, but there's the opposite of that, or the converse of that in a sense, that is, if you don't have mass, then you don't have clocks. In other words, if you say, think of photons, then of course there's a particle that goes along the light cone and never sees any of these. Uh, you don't see the clock tipping of the clock at all. If 
photon isn't interested in that. Uh, and a stronger way of saying the same thing is that Maxwell equations, and even Yang Mills equations, if you don't put the mass in, if you're looking at massless entities, these are conformally invariant. So you can change the scale in different ways all over the place, and the equations work just as well. So they don't need the tenth component, if you like, all they need is the light cones. So if you're thinking about massless things, then conformal geometry is a good thing. And this depends what the universe is doing. Now, why can we get away with thinking about massless things? Well, first of all, let's think about the remote future. In the remote future, you have, well, you've got black holes, and they, see, when there's nothing left of much interest except black holes, I call that the boring era. And it's very boring because if you want to wait for the most massive of black holes to disappear, as they will do according to Hawking back evaporation, you have to wait for about a Google years. I don't know what the exact figure is for the biggest black, uh, black holes that we know. Something like Google, well, that's 10 to the 100 years. And that's very boring, I should say. Waiting, sitting around waiting for a black hole to go off pop. It's, it's not, not much of an explosion after all that time waiting. Um, seems to me to be a pretty boring thing. But then the very boring era is when all the black holes have gone off pop. And that's sitting around and waiting for what? I don't know. Always struck me as a... Well, you see, I, I know, uh, I'm not sure what I know, but uh, it's, one shouldn't perhaps use emotional arguments in physics, but this was an emotional argument. I was sitting around and thinking about this interminable, um, you know, boring, uh, in infinite tedium, it seemed to me, the fate that we're all in for. And uh, that didn't seem like a very nice universe to be in. And that, of course, is an emotional argument. But then I started to think, well, we're not going to be around to be bored by this, but mainly photons. And it's very hard to bore photons. But it's particularly hard to bore photons, not just because they probably don't have experiences, but because, just from what I said before, they shoot along the light cone, and they don't experience the passage of time. So they get right off to this remote future, and they just hit it, the photons go right up to that point, and they say, well, what do we do next? If you like, if they could talk. Um, and so, if there's nothing around but massless things, it seems to me it's quite reasonable to imagine that there should, should be something beyond that. And uh, I hope I get the right pictures. Up here. It's doesn't look like the right picture. Yes, I'm going to say something else in a minute. Let me say something else first before I get to the right picture. I did mention the black holes going off pop. Of course, a question that one would raise here, since the second law of thermodynamics featured very strongly in what I was saying, because the whole point about stretching out the Big Bang was to say, if I haven't got to that really, let me, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, it was to say, to explain how one might characterize the initial state. And one characterization, this is due to Paul Todd, basically, my colleague in Oxford, uh, to say that um, the, you can do this extension. I'll come to a little bit more to that in a minute. But uh, you might say, well, okay, this is driven, pictures driven by the second law of thermodynamics, but then that would mean that the entropy is going up and up and up and up. And so how can you have a picture like this when the entropy should be going up and up and up. Well, I worried about this for quite a long time, and I thought maybe there was something funny about phase space and so on, but it's nothing to do with any of that. In fact, it has to do with this picture here. Here's where I'm going to get into trouble. Probably. I should explain that I have a particular point of view here, which not everybody holds. In fact, it appears that the people who hold this particular view are in a very small minority. But nevertheless, um, let me express it. But in this process here, there is lots of information. Now, um, I don't, yes, this is probably this transparency here. You see, <coughs> currently, where is most of the entropy in the universe? Well, people used to think the microwave background was a lot of entropy. Yes, it's quite a lot of entropy. But it's utter chicken feed compared with the entropy in black holes. Now, the complete domination of entropy is in black and supermassive black holes. So that's where it all is. Almost all of it is in black holes. Now what's going to happen to these black holes? Well, they will gradually evaporate and disappear. What happens to the entropy? 
Well, you see, there are lots of arguments about things like this. Um, I should say that the Beckerstein Hawking entropy formula, I mean, you can justify it, and this is the way Hawking did, using these Bogolubov transformations and that sort of thing, and that's fine. But you can also justify it on much more general grounds, as, as Beckerstein did originally, and it's very consistent with the second law. Now, I hold the view that, in fact, the information is lost. Now, you see, somewhere in this, I can't see this thing very well, but probably you can see it. Somewhere in that is the statement that Hawking at one time believed that information was lost in black holes. At a late, later time, he changed his view and said, no, no, it's regained in some way. I sometimes say to people, well, whichever view you hold on this, at least you've got Stephen Hawking on your side. <laughs> so, uh, I'm taking the earlier Hawking rather than the later one to be on the side of, more or less. And the idea is that information is indeed lost. And if you think classically, it's hard to see anything else. But, well, you can usually draw a conformal diagram, and it's more obvious. But there is this drinking up of stuff all the way fed into the singularity right up to the end. And if you imagine that some supermassive black hole, you could imagine somebody going in a rocket ship and, and classical physics seems to be holding well and then uh, everything getting swallowed up in that black hole. And there's no sense, in my mind, of conveying that information outside the hole without violating all sorts of um, <clears throat> no copying theorems and so on. So uh, it, it always seems to me to be clear that a lot of information must be lost. Of course, that violates unitarity and things like that. But I don't mind that, as I'll like come to you later in the talk, if only briefly. But anyway, the argument is that the information is lost, and I think I've got this upside down. Oh, probably about that. Probably about that. Information is lost, and the way you think about the second law is not that it's violated by this process, but you have to ask what phase space are you using in order to define your volumes and your Boltzmann entries and so on, uh, well, you are using some phase space, which takes into account all the degrees of freedom that you think you should be taking into consideration. But if the black hole swallows degrees of freedom, then you say those degrees of freedom are lost to us, and the phase space has become smaller. So this means that although there is no violation of the second law, because you're changing your mind about which phase space you're using. You're saying, I don't care now about those degrees of freedom which have been swallowed by the black hole, and I calculate my entropy of the universe now not using those degrees of freedom which have been swallowed, and then the entropy that I'm now using is lower than the one that I was using before, but not because the second law has been violated, but because I'm using a different definition of the phase space. And that is the point of view which I'm holding to. It seems to me that it's a completely consistent point of view, and so there is a consistency with this picture in the second law that you are, by the, from start to finish, you're using a much smaller phase space at the end. Okay, well, we'll come to a bit more of that in a minute. Um, let me just say in a little more detail what's the future like. The future is like uh, this nice smooth boundary, according to Hermann Friedrich. We can get away with that. Mm. The one point in addition to what I said here is that there won't be just photons around in our current picture. There will be well, mainly things like electrons and positrons. You might have proton decay, perhaps, but you can't get rid of the electrons and the positrons. Well, you might say, well, they perhaps annihilate. No, they can't do that because they'll get separated in this uh, space-like when you have positive cosmological constant, you're going to have a space-like boundary here, and your electrons and positrons will get outside the horizons, and there is no hope that they could find each other and uh, annihilate, at least not in my view, and so something's got to happen. Well, the view that I hold to this um, is that there is a fade-out of mass. Now you see people often say, well, you can't map in with mass, and perhaps in standard particle physics you have um, mass being one of the Casimir operators of a Poincaré group, and it's one of the first things you do when you consider things which are conserved in particle physics, um, and uh, the idea is that, well, that's not quite right, because if you have a cosmological constant, you should be looking at the Sitter group, and the, and the Casimir uh, um, 
operators um, are the decision group is different, and so therefore um, you don't have the same uh, things which can be with all the uh, generators of the symmetry, the different address mass is now not one of them. So you have this issue of maybe there is a fade out of mass in a very remote region. Now, it has been said to me by distinguished people this, that this is the weakest part of the theory. Well, every theory has got to have a weakest part, and so if that's the weakest part of this theory, I'm quite happy about it. <laughs> Anyway, that's uh, just what I wanted to say here. Now, okay, maybe, I'm not saying that the charge disappears, I'm just saying that in the remote limit, the mass fades out, and the, just at the very last minute, it becomes massless. You can't, you can't have massless particles around now, which are charged, but you could asymptotically have the massless, and that's the argument which I'm trying to make here. Okay, so that's the remote future. What about the remote past? Well, now here, you see, you're getting back down into the Big Bang, and the idea is that uh, um, particles get more and more and more um, energetic, and so that the mass of the particles are less and less relevant. So again, in the limit, as you approach backwards into the Big Bang, you're playing with massless particles. And so, at both ends, I'm saying, virtually, you have massless particles. I used to say, what is the special condition on the Big Bang? Uh, to give the sort of limitation on gravitational degrees of freedom. So I'd say the vial curvature hypothesis, which is to say for some reason unknown, and I was thinking of in terms of some funny kind of quantum gravity theory or something, uh, that the vial curvature had to vanish at initial singularities. It's a tight asymmetrical assumption, uh, but it's uh, less than could do. My colleague Paul Todd has a different way of saying it, which is simply to say that the Big Bang conformally can be extended to something where you can go to the past of it. So this was the idea. It was just, in his view, just a mathematical trick. It wasn't to say there was anything before the Big Bang. It was to say this was a very nice mathematical characterization to say that the bio curvature, well, in his scheme, it actually is zero at the Big Bang, but it's bounded. It would be smooth at this boundary. It turns out with this model that I'm proposing here that it's actually zero, and I'll come to that in just a second, but the point is that the Big Bang is meant to match exactly onto the remote future of a previous eon, and so these particles which ask where did we come from, well, the answer is they came from the remote future of a previous eon. And so, the claim is that this fits very nicely, and that is the proposal. Okay. Now, I just told you what the theme is. Is it true? Well, here's where people run into some trouble. They say, oh, that's a very nice scheme, and then they go off and do something else. Um, for a while, I've been arguing that uh, there should be observational evidence of this. And I asked myself, what is the most violent thing that I could think of, the most violent thing, apart from the Big Bang itself, and that is the collision between supermassive black holes. You see, we have a black hole in the center of our galaxy, which is about four million times the mass of the sun. We are on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. It has a much bigger one, I forget the figure now, 40 times as big or something. Uh, when we have our collision, not for a few thousand million years, so don't worry. <laughs> Actually, it would be nice to see it, because it won't move. Because it probably won't hit another star or anything like that. But um, it would be fun, yes. <laughs> but I'm afraid we're not going to see that. But anyway, the point is that the black, supermassive black holes probably won't hit each other, but they'll probably go through each other maybe a few times. If they don't encounter each other the first time, eventually they'll feel each other out and spiral into each other, and kaboom. A bit more than kaboom at the end. And this will cause a whacking great explosion. Now, these explosions will be in the form of gravitational waves, Mainly, almost entirely, I think, gravitational waves. And here's a sort of cartoon of that happening. Here we have this is the crossover <coughs> from the previous eon to ours. This is us up here somewhere looking back. And this is a couple of. Well, you imagine a cluster of galaxies here with a few supermassive black, black holes in them. There will be one kaboom and then another one and then another one. And these things will happen several times. And this would look to us like concentric <coughs> of what? 
Well, here's where you have to ask what happens to gravitational waves when they encounter this crossover. And for that, I need to get a little bit more detail. But before doing that, just let me say, make a comment, that I think there is good evidence, although a lot of people have a lot of trouble believing in this, that there is good evidence for the existence of these concentric rings and so on. And two groups, uh, Vahe Guzaj and Armenian College of Iron, look for these things. Um, lots of people are skeptical about it. There's a Polish group headed by Christoph Meisner, and uh, I think they, they've done this in a much more conventional way, and I think the evidence is really pretty strong that there is something going on there. What's more remarkable is not that there is some evidence of a previous eon, but there is some evidence that this previous eon was not all that uniform. That is to say, you see big regions where these things seem to be taking place, the centers of them, and other regions where not too much is happening. So this was indicated, indicating that there are some, on this picture, some super-duper clusters, say, absolutely vast regions. And presumably that would imply that in our own eon, this is the case too. We have to depend on more detailed analysis, I suppose, to see where these regions might be. Um, I don't want to go into this here, but I do think there is some evidence for this, and I do want to say something about that later, as it has relevance to other things I want to say. Now let's give you a little bit more in terms of the details. There's an important point first which I want to make, which is an observation, a mathematical observation. I made a long time, just couldn't see what to make of it. But when you look at the, I was looking at Spinner's ways of looking at uh, gravity and curvatures and so on, but that, that's not important here. Um, if you look at the way that the <coughs> things behave under conformal rescalings, there's some curious thing about gravity, that you have two different scalings for the same quantity. Now what's the quantity I'm talking about? This is the vial curvature, this is the conformal curvature. Now since it's the conformal curvature, it has a particular way of scaling under transformations, which tells you that it behaves like conformal curvature, I and mean, that's absolutely unambiguous. And that's what I write down here, if I rescale the metric, the hatted one is rescaled by a factor of omega, that's the conformal rescaling factor, then the metric, oh, sorry, the, the vial tensor scales in the way I've written down here. If you put all the indices down, it scales with the omega squared. Now, if you take another quantity, which is equal to C, but I'm saying it has a different role to play. This is the thing I'm calling K. And what's the role that K has? You see this more easily with spinners, but I don't want to go into that here. But K um, behaves, if you like, like a, a graviton density or something like that. And it has a conformally invariant wave equation. And this conformally invariant wave equation, as part of different spins, spin two or spin one or spin zero or spin a half, uh, it behaves with the scaling like we do here. Now this is important, because if you want to know, suppose you have this black hole collision, and you want to know how these gravitational waves behave as they get, get out to infinity, it's best to use the K scaling, because that K scaling tells you that what is finite at infinity. And this is something that, that we played around a long time ago with looking at asymptotic structure of gravitational fields and energy carried away and all that sort of thing. Um, but it depends on saying, Look at the K if you want to see how the gravitational waves act. It's a thing like the Maxwell equations, if you like, that tells you how the I mean, Maxwell, the way the Maxwell field tensor behaves, if you like. That tells you how the, how the electromagnetic waves go out to infinity. And then this thing behaves, that has a finite value as infinity if you rescale properly. And the K is just like that. So if you want to see what the gravitational degrees of freedom are, freedom of doing out of infinity, you use the K. Now you see, they behave differently under conformal scaling, which means that K will be finite out of infinity because it's carrying the information of the gravitational waves in a conformally invariant way, but the C has a, behaves differently with this difference in the conformal factor, and so it's got to be zero at infinity. Now if you're going to match it to the next conformal curvature on the next eon, that's got to be zero too, if it's got to be conformally smooth. And this goes beyond what Paul Todd was saying. You see, he was saying that the C has to be bounded or smooth on the initial boundary. But what I'm saying here, it's got to be zero. 
So this is, in fact, a version of a vial curvature hypothesis, that the Big Bang, the vial curvature, is actually zero in this scheme. So if you measure it for somewhere, and you say, well, no, 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 that says that BMOs or something that tells us there's vial curvature, that would be bad for the scheme, because this scheme is telling you it has to be zero. Okay, of course, the scheme might be wrong, but that's, uh, that's what it's trying to tell us here. Uh, so this means that you can't, well, I, I'm saying sort of the same thing here, I think, that I just said. This is also something which I didn't quite say, but let's say it here, that is that the, conform, the, the cosmological constant, you see, when I was first heard about the cosmological constant, well, the acceleration, I was not very keen on believing in, in it, because I had a thing which enabled me to do something in twister theory I couldn't do if there was a cosmological constant that wasn't zero, so I had this wrong reason for believing that it had to be zero. Eventually, I was persuaded, no, there's good evidence for it, and it should be uh, positive, and so I had to change my allegiance. I thought, oh, well, maybe it's not such a bad idea to have it. The point is, if it's zero, you have a null boundary of infinity. If it's positive, it's space-like boundary. If it's negative, then you have a time-like boundary. In ADS, CFT, people like to have it negative. But the observations seem to tell us that it is a cosmological constant and I can't really see what else it could be, then it's positive, and that means that the crossover from one eon to the next is indeed over a space-like hypersurface. And the Big Bang, uh, actually, there's reasons to see why that has to be space-like too. So the matching does require a positive cosmological constant. Okay, now that's just a comment here. Um, let me say something a little bit more detailed about how one does these things. Here we have the crossover surface, and to, to do one's calculations, it's useful to use a metric where you see to, to see which way up the... I have the circumflex for the pre-crossover metric and the hat-check, what do we call it, for the post. If you think, think of the light cone, and the light cone is chopped in two by the surface, and so the bit of the light cone in the future... This is just in the moment. See which way around it is, and the bottom half is down there. Okay, so that, that's the picture. And... Then you want a bandage metric, that G doesn't have any <coughs> on top of it, because most of the calculations it's doing, you would be doing would be for the metric on the bandage. And this fits nicely and smoothly. So the idea is to have a nice smooth metric on this intermediate region, and then you want to match it at the two sides. And then you can do your calculations on this intermediate region, and that's the best way to do it. Now, this is, let me tell you the sort of, I'm not going to go into details here, but I'll tell you the sort of thing that happens. First of all, in order to describe Einstein's equations, say pre, well, either way, but let's say pre-Big Bang, or pre-crossover, um, what you want to do is introduce a, an omega, which I'll say is capital omega, a conformal factor, which has no physical content, it's just put there to help you describe things when you get close to this crossover. And it just is a conformal transformation, conformal rescaling. So you do all your calculations there. It doesn't have any physical content, but it has some curious features. I'd like to say the cosmological constant is con really constant on both sides. So that's a bit. In fact, I like to say it's three. Now you might say that's a bit of a stretch of the imagination because isn't it tiny, very tiny? And three is not all that tiny. Yeah, you've got this freedom. You see, you've got these absurd units called Planck units, where we make all things totally unphysical, which you don't to do anything practical with physics, but uh, very beautiful if you want to do theoretical calculations, you should use Planck units, and what do you do? You take the speed of light to be 1, you take uh, Planck's constant to be 2 pi, and you take the gravitational constant to be equal to 1. Well, what I'm doing is not doing that, I'm taking the cosmological constant to be equal to 3. You might say, why 3? Well, it just makes the calculations a lot easier. That's just a... Well, you might say, why is, Planck's, why is Planck's constant 2 pi? Well, only because Planck's constant over 2 pi equals 1 makes calculations easier. Okay, now, what I'm going to do with this omega now is make me think of it as a bit like a field. And if it was like a field, it would have an energy momentum tensor. And this energy momentum tensor, well, I used to call this the new improved energy momentum tensor because that was the paper of which various, I've forgotten them all now, uh, wrote this paper. Various, Distinguished physicists introduced a thing called that. 
Ted Newman and I, um, in, in a paper we, in a footnote, had the definition, which is the one I'm giving here. And since I hadn't looked at the other paper, and since this was the only thing we could do, I thought it must be what was in this other paper. Then when I finally looked at it, I couldn't make any head or tail of why it was the same or different or anything. But anyway, never mind. It's the only thing I think one could sensibly do to find an energy momentum tensor for this funny omega, pretending it's a field. Now, you see, it's not a real field because it doesn't have any separate degrees of freedom. It's just put there to enable you to talk about scrap, talk about future now infinity, future infinity, and to continue your equations across. That's all it's there for. It doesn't have any physical degrees of freedom. Um, but it's handy. If you pretend it's a field, this is its energy momentum tensor, and I've written it down here. Um, what you find is that the Einstein equations with cosmological constant, pre-crossover, have the form, and I'm now talking about the matter content, just let's pretend it's just massless things. It could be um, Maxwell fields or other fields if you're allowed to look at the remote limit where the mass has become totally insignificant in this scheme. Um, then the, that's the energy momentum tensor of the fields, and the Einstein equation is the, 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 this T here of the, let's call it the, fan, I call it a phantom field, and I know the word phantom means something else in particle physics sometimes. So I call it a phantom field because it's not a real field, it's just put in there to make the equations work up to crossover and over it. So this phantom field doesn't pick up any degrees of freedom, but it's, it's, it's sort of a partner to gravity to make it so you can write it down nicely. And the equation, Einstein's equations with cosmological constant are simply that this T equals the energy momentum tensor of the matter. That's Einstein's equations. Okay, now what we're going to do is to cross over onto the other side. Now crossing over to the other side, a natural thing to do is to make the conformal factor on the other side, is the big the big omega is the big one here. You have a big omega that goes to infinity, pre-crossover, and the, its inverse, with a minus sign, to keep it positive from one side to the other, its inverse is the little omega, and that goes to zero as you come to crossover. So this is just to make the equations nice. And this, actually, this equation doesn't have any physical content as it stands, but it's a very useful thing to introduce. It's the reciprocal hypothesis to say that the little omega is the inverse of the big one, the minus sign just to keep it positive. And then what you find is that, the, that the, with this convention, that you find that now the big omega does behave like a physical field. And so the funny idea is that you think, well, what happens to the gravitational degrees of freedom? And again, it depends on looking at calculations in detail, which I'm not going to do. Uh, I think what I'm saying at the bottom here is more or less on this transparency here. The information in the gravitational degrees of freedom, as I say, the vial curvature goes to zero, but the gravitational waves carry information which now is converted into sort of second derivatives of this omega field. Now this omega field now becomes a real field and it picks up the gravitational degrees of freedom. So when I was showing you my picture of the uh, black holes and so on, and, and what do they do on the other side? Well, these degrees, degrees of freedom go over into these higher, higher, higher order terms of this omega field. Now what is this omega field? It has to have some real physical content. And it doesn't make any sense physically unless it is something. And it would be something which dominates the whole of the matter content of the universe after the, after the Big Bang. So what is it? Well, the claim here is that it's dark matter. It's the initial form of dark matter. It would have to pick up a mass at some stage, just that the mass fades out of other things. It would have to pick up a mass. So then, and, and you wanted to delay, one of the equations you write down is to try and delay that picking up the mass. I'm not going to give you equations here because it will take me too long. But you find that it does have to pick up a mass. And the argument is, what is this mass? Well, what is the stuff that this dark matter stuff on the other side? Because nobody really knows what it is. So that gives me the opportunity to say what I think it might be. Because it doesn't need to contradict what. It contradicts other people's theories, but it doesn't 
seem to contradict observation, as far as I can tell. It would interact only gravitationally because it is really a partner to gravity, in a sense. It is that partner that pre-crossover is simply there to make the equations hold together in a conformally invariant way. It's not doesn't have any more degrees of freedom. On the other side, it picks up those degrees of freedom that would have been in the bio curvature, but are now transferred to this omega field. In fact, what you would look at in these observations to see whether this thing that I'm talking about here is evidence here is actually there out in the observations, you would be looking at the kick that the, the signal gives to the dark matter. So that's what you're supposed to be looking at. Now what is, is it, a, it really is a partner to gravity, it is, it is gravity in a certain sense, but a scale of partner which has only become real there because it's crossed over. If it's just gravity, it will only interact gravitationally. Well, that's what people seem to say about dark matter, it only interacts gravity. What's its mass? Well, if it can only be gravity, the first guess is that this is Planck mass particles. Now that's a bit outrageous, so I asked people, like Jim Peebles, and I just saw Joe Silk at a conference not so long ago, and I asked him, suppose the dark matter particles are Planck mass particles. Well, first he thought I was saying black holes, because people talk about in the uh, Planck mass black, hole, black holes, and he was worrying about Hawking evaporation or something. Well, I don't know what you say about Hawking evaporation down at the Planck scale, I mean, it, who knows what space time is like. Um, but I'm not saying that. These are not black holes, these are Planck mass particles. So that's the idea. But they've got to decay. Why have they got to decay? Well, because when you get to the crossover surface, I don't want them to build up they've got to have all gone. So they will decay from Big Bang to the final crossover. And then you get a whole lot of new ones. And then they will gradually decay away, and then you get a lot of new ones. Now I was talking to Christoph Meisner about this, because originally I had the idea that it was these events which... You see, yeah, let, 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 let's say a bit more about this. You're looking back at the cosmic microwave background, which is disturbances which have taken place in the early universe. And according to this scheme, so I don't have inflation. Why well, don't I have inflation? Inflation would mess everything up, because it would make this picture have an enormous stretch between the two sides, and it just doesn't work. There's no question that I can't add inflation to this model. It just doesn't work. But if it's not inflation, and I say there are bad things about inflation, such as stretching the universe flat. But there are good things about inflation, which, when I say good things, there are things which you seem to need it for. And the main thing you seem to need it for, well, one of the things is you have to you get correlations outside what would be the horizon size without inflation or something. Well, that's all right here, because correlations will be present because of the previous neon. But what's more striking and much more important here is one of the big reasons for inflation is the fact that you get this very close to scale invariance. You look at the temperature variations or in, in, as you go around in, in the sky, and you see these <coughs> fluctuations which seem to have this scale invariant property, which is very curious. And this is one of the reasons you seem to need to have a scale invariant stage of the universe in order to have an explanation for the scale invariance. Well, you see, in this picture, you do have that already, and it's not artificially introduced. You see, in, in standard inflation, you've got to make your infraton feel, well, people draw a different curve, more or less drawn by hand. You see, what, what does the potential function, what's got to do that, it's got to do that, it's got to, to, to go up and do that, and something. There's no good theoretical reason for that. The reason is just that you wanted to do certain things. But here, you automatically have an exponential expansion just sitting there. It's in before the Big Bang, not after. This this has certain uh, resonances with ideas due to Veneziano, where he had a model in which there was <coughs> a sort of inflation which took place before the Big Bang. So it has that in common with his model. But, but not very similar to it in other respects. <coughs> but anyway, the idea is it's this exponential expansion which is causing these scale invariant fluctuations in this, in this, what we see. Now, 
I used to think that this had to be, well, these black hole collisions and all that stuff. And I was very puzzled when it wasn't uniform and all sorts of things. And then Christoph persuaded me, look, this is a very tiny effect. The effect that you're looking at, these rings that, you know, most people said they're not there at all. <laughs> but if they are there, they're not the major thing you're seeing. They're not the cause of the scale invariant perturbations or variations in, in the temperature in the microwave background. So what else could it be? Well, it could be the decay of these dark matter particles. And that's what I'm trying to say. Now, I'm calling these dark matter particles error bonds. You see, this is, I look up in Wikipedia and everybody looks up in Wikipedia. But I looked up to see, is there a good god who would be calling these things after? <clears throat> but the Greeks didn't have a good god for this. But the Egyptians did. And this god was called Erebos. And he not only was the god of darkness, yeah, that's just right, but he was also the first god, apparently. And so this fits in very nicely. Of course, you might see these are Erebosons, because the Erebos, you've got the Ere sitting in the already, so you can say, oh, yeah, Erebosons. Now, the reason I'm not, I'm not so keen on calling them Erebosons is I'm not altogether sure they're bosons. Maybe they were at one time, and that's probably, you have to take that view. But I'm taking a view which is rather consistent with the view which I was having before about the information being lost in black holes. The view is that when you combine gravity with quantum mechanics, you don't, unitary, unitarity goes out the window, well perhaps that's a bit strong, but unitarity will not hold when gravitational effects are there. See, this is partly because I think that you need it for state reduction. The state reduction to me is a physical process which happens and happens when principles of Einstein's general relativity start to impinge on ideas about quantum mechanics. And one can do estimates. I don't suppose I have time for that here. How much time do I have, by the way? Negative, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, negative. No, or is it you, you, you can go on. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say it a little bit here, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. No, you see, <clears throat> I'm saying, not just the scheme that I like, but other schemes which say gravity has a role to play in state reduction, which say that if you have a Planck mass particle, can it be in two places at once? Well, you see, the idea would be that as it starts to spread out, as its wave function starts to spread, it would reduce itself spontaneously. And so it would behave like a classical particle, at least when it gets going, maybe in very early stages, it behaves from the counter. But it would behave like a classical particle. And this is a bit outrageous because um, that's not the way t people tend to think of particles. But yes, I'm trying to say it, it's got to be. And there are reasons, when I was, things I was talking to Yvette about also um, a few months ago, which led me to believe that these things had to behave classically. The problem being, actually, that if they would behave quantum mechanically, then uh, they would be all at once. And if they're decays of a Planck mass entity, and if you did detect it, it would just blow the thing apart because you'd have a, an artillery shell energy in that observation. Now, if they're classical, well, what would they be like? They would be, well, Planck frequency, that's pretty high frequency, you think. Uh, but what, what do these Planck, Planck frequency particles do? Well, the point that comes out of this, this is a little bit of uh, elementary general relativity here, Suppose you're looking at a bundle of light rays, and these bundles of light rays enter a region of our curvature. Well, they would squash in one direction and stretch in the other direction. This is what gravitational wave detectors look for. And you have this squashing one and stretching in the other direction. If you have Ricci curvature, it's squashing in all directions. The Ricci curvature squashes all, that's what mass would do. Bar curvature stretches. Now let's suppose and you can think of this as an optical bench, and you've got lenses, and if you have a lens, the power of that lens is the inverse of its focal length. And if you have two lenses right up close to each other, then the total power is the sum of the two powers. If I move them apart, there's a correction term which comes from the distance between them, uh, which is proportional to, well, minus the distance, I guess, times the product of the two powers. Now suppose these are astigmatic lenses, like what gravitational wave would do. This is a lens which is two directions at right angles, one of them magnifies and the other does the opposite. Positive lens, negative lens, 
equal and opposite. If I have two, one through a right angle, right up to each other, they would completely cancel each other out. But suppose I pull them apart, then this correction term will mean there is a focusing effect. Suppose I have an oscillat oscillatory wave, which goes one the other, one the other, one the other, like this, then there will be a residual, which is a positive focusing. And this also, it, you, you can look at the Bondi and Troutman, the definitions of a mass uh, carried by gravitational waves and so on, and you see that this is ju it's just the same effect. But it's not local, and it's something which comes about through this oscillation between the via curvature and the opposite. So this means that if you have a very high frequency gravitational wave, it will behave like a burst of Ricci tensor. So this is the suggestion that these Erebon decays will look like, and it's not the way gravitational wave detectors are set up to be, because they look for this in one direction and out the other direction. But I should think that one of the things that Yvette's talking about ought to be perfectly happy with a thing which is squashing in both directions. So, so in the two directions, not in the direction of the, of the wave itself, but in the two orthogonal to that, you would think an inward squashing in all directions. So this would be the claim that we ought to see such signals. Now, here are the things. Are we likely to see them? Are there going to be a little tiny effect that we'll never see? There are some unknowns, of course. One of the unknowns is, is um, well, you could, see, you could make a good estimate of how many of these things are around, what their density is, because if they're, you know, you know what the dark matter density should be, and you know um, how massive these little things are. I think that, I forgot that I said what, what um, um, Joe Silk said to me, he said, yes, that Planck mass is well within the range, and he was quite happy with particles of that Planck mass, just from the observational side. Um, they, they mustn't decay like those of black holes, but if they're like ordinary particles, that's fine. But you see, we have two things that are supposed to, these are supposed to be doing, and you can sort of balance these against each other. One of these is the microwave background. So here's us, looking back at the crossover, and we're seeing Erebon decays as they come across and into the next eon. So they would be just the decays, which would be these graviton signals. And so you would, you would have a, a... That would be giving you, according to the scheme, the microwave background fluctuations in temperature. So you have a, a number from that. You've also got things like the spectral parameter, which tells you how it deviates from, from uh, exact uh, scale invariance. Now the scale invariance would come about if the decay time of these particles is fairly long by in comparison with the age of the universe, well when I say the age of the universe, I mean a, a time until now which is um, comparable with when the uh, so-called dark energy is, is about is not much more than the actual energy content. So we're looking about from about now to I don't know how far into the future exactly, but then that's where the effects from the next eon you would see the uh, fluctuations. So you've got to figure out from the fluctuations. And the point I'm making here is that the gravitational wave signals from these supermassive black hole encounters seems to be a small effect in, by comparison with what you do see. And so it says, okay, maybe that's fairly small compared with the big effect, which would be the, the zero bond the case. Now you're looking at it down here. This is now us looking at the ones in our eon, and that's what gravitational wave detectors might see. That's telling us, roughly speaking, that the Erebon decays should be perhaps a lot bigger than the gravitational wave effects. And since they do see a little signal, which is the gravitational wave effects, maybe these other signals will be bigger. It's not quite as simple as that, because you, the black holes in this picture only exist for a little small time in the whole scale of things. So you really have to look at that a bit more carefully. And all I can say is that I haven't been able to go through the details of this to see how strong these signals should be. But it does seem to me quite in the halves that there could be signals that would be present in, in gravitational detector signals which might be seen either in LIGO or, or the detectors which Yvette was talking about 
in the previous talk, and I hope they would be. The thing is that if, if your detectors get working, you actually see where they're coming from, and that would be very interesting because we would have some idea about where the major dark matter concentrations are, and if you can get some indication that these things not only are there, they would be like blips, I should say, it would be like almost instantaneous events, um, and without getting all these fancy curves that you see in the, in the black hole encounters. So that's what, it, I suspect there are things that they, they just throw in the rubbish bin because they, they're not what people are looking for. But uh, it would be interesting to see if those signals are already in the observations. Um, it would need a little bit more on the theory side to see how big these effects should be, what the distribution should be. You see some, the closer ones it would be big events and there will be lots and lots more of, of little ones. And the, the sort of distribution of that one has to work up. It seems to me, with, with a bit more work on this one, should be able to get some kind of an estimate on that. And perhaps one should make that estimate first, because before having to look to see whether these signals are there or not. Anyway, thank you very much.